Hey YouTubers, uh, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and we're going to read some more of our book, Poison Power by Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin, and I'm going to make an effort to keep the comments from the peanut gallery to a minimum tonight and not get too excited and get us through this book because it has information that has just been conveniently forgotten. Let's just put it to you that way. We are on Chapter 5. Promises, Promises, on page 128 at the beginning of the first paragraph. Here the uranium or plutonium is dissolved in acid and purified so that it can be prepared to go back to the nuclear reactor. But astronomical amounts of radioactive byproducts remain after this process is complete. Usually a nuclear reactor can function for about two years before fuel reprocessing becomes essential. This means that every two years all of the radioactive material generated by uranium fission must be removed from the nuclear power plant, transported by rail or truck to the fuel reprocessing plant, and they are separated from uranium or plutonium which are recovered for future use. Mm. I think we're going to find out from uh, Don and Gilmore that sometimes it has to sit there before that happens. The immense quantities of radioactive byproducts must then be transported in some fashion to an ultimate repository. Plans call for allowing the uranium fuel to remain for a period of months after removal from the reactor so that the short-lived radioactive byproducts decay away. This cuts the radioactivity of the spent fuel rod some, but still massive quantities of the extremely hazardous strontium-90 and cesium-137 have decayed hardly at all in this short cooling off period of several months. These radioactive substances, with half-lives of 27 and 33 years respectively, must be kept isolated from the environment for periods like several hundred years if damage to human beings and other living beings is to be avoided. It is difficult for the layman to understand or conceive of the enormous quantities of hazardous radioactive byproducts like strontium-90 and cesium-137 that are involved. We will explain. A thousand megawatt reactor operating for two years, the fuel changing cycle time, produces as much of these long persisting radioactive poisons as about 2,000 atomic bombs of the Hiroshima size. A mega, a thousand megawatt reactor operating for two years produces as much of these long persisting radioactive poisons as about 2,000 atomic bombs of the Hiroshima size. This sounds incredible, but it is thoroughly documented as a known fact of physics. Ten such reactors and the AEC plans for some 500 by the turn of the century, oh, thank God we didn't actually get them all, operating for two years have as much radioactivity of long persistence in them as the combined total of all fissionable of all fission pro product radioactivities in all of the bomb tests of the United States and the Soviet Union combined for the entire period of atmospheric testing up through 1962. Did you understand that? Ten reactors operating for two years have as much radioactivity of long persistence in them as the combined total of all fission product radioactivities in all the bomb tests of the United States and the Soviet Union combined for the entire period of atmospheric testing up through 1962. That's only 10 reactors. Wow. During the bomb test, that amount of radioactivity spread fallout around the globe, aroused the concern of more than 11,000 biological scientists, and was finally a major factor leading to the 1963 treaty to ban atmospheric tests of such weapons. 
Yet the AEC is now proposing to build reactors containing inventories many times this total amount of radioactivity on the edge of our most populous metropolitan centers. Trucks roaming on our crowded highways will carry radioactive cargoes for, to reprocessing plants and eventually to a final burial spot. I actually saw one of those on a freeway in L.A. I was freaked out. Those events which must go absolutely perfectly at every step along a complicated route just described are these. First there's the mining and refueling, then the enrichment, then the fuel fabrication. And out of the fuel fabrication it goes into the nuclear power plant. The nuclear power plant sends portions off for reprocessing, portions to liquid storage, portions to burial, portions to the water, and some to the air. And then uh, from the reprocessing plant, it goes to liquid storage, goes back into enrichment. Let me show you the diagram. You see that? It's pretty interesting. What does the small print say? The above diagram shows the coarse radioactive substances follow from the mining through disposal. Oh, okay. So that's it shows us from mining to disposal, and actually there's really no disposal. Because it's not disposing of it if you put it into the water or the air. That's just rearranging it. Okay, so number one, at the reactor itself, bearing enormous quantities of radioactive poison, no accidents which can distribute such poisons to the atmosphere, land or water, can be tolerated. Number two, every two years, the fuel carrying this burden of poison should be transported without mishap by rail and truck to the fuel cleaning plants. Any significant accidental release in this phase of the operation can render sizable areas of our nation uninhabitable for many years. Number three, at the fuel reprocessing plant, absolute per perfect containment must be assured year in, year out. Well, we've already seen that fail at practically every single plant, haven't we? Number four, the waste radioactivities dangerous for hundreds of years, must be transported to a final resting place. And this waste must be guarded from any escape into the environment for periods longer than the recorded history of any government. Number five. At no step, reactor, transport, fuel reprocessing, transport, waste burial, can sabotage of the operation conceivably occur without disastrous consequences for human beings. Yet there will be hundreds of plants and transportation vehicles that must be protected against sabotage perfectly. Senseless, indiscriminate bombings and arson are hardly an unknown occurrence in the United States today. We shall return later to the issue of a major accident at the reactor itself, and we shall see that no one has the vaguest notion of the risk of an accident there. And we are planning for hundreds, hundreds of such reactors. Human perfection is required at all these many steps in the entire cycle of events, and required constantly for hundreds of years. No government has ever undertaken such massive responsibility in the history of mankind. When one considers the fantastic requirements, perfect safety, perfect engineering, perfect reliability, perfect loyalty, for every aspect of such a massive nationwide program to avert disaster, one wonders how the American people can be deceived into accepting such a solution to our power shortage problems. Obviously, they have no way of knowing any better. They are constantly assured by the spokesmen of the AEC and the power companies that nuclear energy is clean and safe. And we still hear that to this day, don't we? 
All that... All that these spokesmen can conceivably mean by the word clean is that the radioactive poisons can't be seen or smelled. In many ways, it is unfortunate that one can't see or smell radioactivity. If one could, the real hazards of this irreversible environmental poison might be better appreciated by the public. Instead of considering the multitude of steps that must be carried out perfectly every day, every year, in every reactor they plan to build, in every reprocessing plant, in every truck or railway car carrying radioactive waste, in every final burial spot for waste, AEC officials focus on the very tip of the iceberg by talking only about what radioactivity the reactor itself releases under normal operations. Precisely how do the AEC spokesmen reassure us that we won't receive disastrous radiation as a result of the operation of, a nuclear, of nuclear power plants? At first, they emphatically denied that 170 millirads would produce any significant harm to human beings. They denied and ridiculed the estimates that such exposure in the entire population would finally produce 32,000 extra cancers and leukemia deaths per year, plus 150 to 1 million 500,000 extra genetic deaths per year. They provided no counter evidence of their own. They just denied the numbers. Scare laden, said the AEC spokesman. Alarmist proclaimed the AEC spokesman. Hyperbol hyperbolic claims the AEC spokesman pronounced. They offered no counter evidence. Instead, steadily increasing numbers of very prominent biological scientists not associated with the AEC announced that the predictions above were by no means exaggerated. Professor Linus Pauling, winner of two Nobel Prizes, published his estimate that if everyone in the country were to be exposed to the allowable amount of radiation, we might expect 96,000 extra cancer plus leukemia cases rather than the 32,000 extra cases estimated by us. Professor Pauling is correct when he states that we estimated 32,000 to be the minimum number of extra cancers and leukemias. Professor Pauling's number, 96,000, does indeed have a high probability of being closer to the true stupendous cost in human misery and death from exposure to the limits which the Federal Radiation Council has set and which the AEC regards as acceptable. AEC is now the NRC, folks. The eminent Nobel laureate geneticist Professor Joshua Letterberg estimated that the annual cost of the health burden from genetically induced diseases at the currently legal federal radiation allowable doses would eventually be $10 billion a year and quite a number quite consistent with our estimate of 150,000 to 1,500,000 extra genetic deaths per year. Professor Lederberg added that there, were an un, that there were uncertainties in his calculations and that the true financial cost of added medical and health care could range between $1 billion and $100 billion annually. Even if we were callous enough to disregard the toll of human suffering involved in possibly a million and a half more deaths per year, from degenerative diseases like diabetes and circulatory disorders, the $100 billion estimated as the cost of health care for these unfortunates is roughly comparable to the entire national federal budget annually. Wow. Surely a radiation standard that could lead to this unspeakable burden on society deserves careful examination. Is such a burden necessary for the orderly development of nuclear energy? Indeed, one wonders at the irrationality of such a standard for whatever purpose. <clears throat> 
Other scientists, too, have provided their estimates of the cancer leukemia risk and the genetic risk, including eminent men like Professor E.B. Lewis of California Institute of Technology, Dr. Carl Z. Morgan, Director of Health Physics Laboratory of Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and Dr. R. H. Mole of British of the British Medical Research Council. Recently, Dr. James D. Watson, another Nobel laureate in genetics, stated, The amount of research now being done on the connection of cancer and radiation is totally inconsistent with proposals for widespread introduction of nuclear power plants into highly populated areas. Hmm. wonder why he said that. That's interesting. Even more alarming than all these estimates of the high risk of allowable dose of radiation, the great British researcher in the field, Dr. Alice Stewart, came forth with solid evidence that the fetus in utero is especially sensitive, about 50 times as sensitive to cancer or leukemia induction as is the adult. Wow. The precise numerical results for cancer and leukemia predicted for exposure by to the excuse me I'm going to start that sentence again the precise numerical results for cancer or leukemia predicted for exposure to an amount of radiation proclaimed by the atomic energy promoters to be without effect differed among the various scientists who provided their estimates but all the estimates pointed to a grave hazard is it really very comforting that we estimate 32,000 extra cancers, while Professor Pauling estimates 96,000? The real issue is that the hazard is estimated in the many tens of thousands of unnecessary cancer and leukemia deaths each year, rather than near zero or at zero. Faced with an ever-increasing number of similar estimates of the grave hazard of ionizing radiation, both with respect to cancer plus leukemia and genetic diseases, the Atomic Energy Commission proponents began to realize that their attack on those who estimated the true hazards of radiation was backfiring badly. So AEC spokesmen began to say instead that we, and presumably all these other specialists who have spoken out, just don't understand how the FRC regulations work. Nuclear power plants are not exposing anyone to anything like this amount of radioactivity. They say, and therefore, the estimates of the serious hazards of radiation must be wrong. They appear to have little respect for the intelligence of the American people. What AEC officials are saying, in essence, is that if you are not exposed to allowable amounts of radiation, you won't suffer such devastating effects of cancer, leukemia, or genetic diseases. But what are we to make of the AEC's official position that they will permit us all to be exposed to this limit of 170 rads per year, and that they believe no harm can come to us if they do? AEC officials point out that nuclear electric power generation hasn't yet delivered anywhere near the 170 millirads as an average to the population of the United States. So fortunately, the American people have not as yet been exposed to highly dangerous levels of radiation. But the AEC fails to point out that nuclear electric power stations haven't generated enough electricity so far to be worth discussing. A handful of small nuclear power plants is in operation, the largest approximately one half of the power level of those being planned. But now the AEC is planning ultimately 450 to 650 large reactor power plants, plus the necessary reprocessing plants, plus the necessary transportation and burial facilities. Roughly a thousandfold increase in nuclear power generation. Oh my God, am I glad we stopped that. That got stopped. Wow. And incredibly, they ask us to believe that this 1,000-fold increase in potential radiation hazard 
We are not likely to experience any more exposure to radiation than during the early days when the nuclear industry is in its infancy. Wow. These people are incredulous. This is like saying that a thousand eight-cylinder cars packed into a mile of a highway are not likely to produce any more pollution than one Model T Ford. Spokesmen for the nuclear power industry assumed that all nuclear power plants would operate perfectly according to design specifications, which they expected to be infallible. They ignored prior experience, which shows them to this to be a pipe dream. Second, they conceive only a minute possibility of minor or massive accidental release of radioactivity at the nuclear power station or in transport of the radioactive laden fuel rods or at the reprocessing plant or in the preparation of the mammoth quantities of radioactivities for ultimate burial or in the transport, transport of such enormous quantities of radioactive debris to ultimate burial sites. Hmm. Third, they assume that sabotage at any step along this long chain to be unthinkable, largely because the thought was so chilling, the AEC officials hoped the thought would go away. Wow, I just looked up and saw that we're at 21 minutes, so I'm going to stop. We're on page 138, uh, and we're on the second paragraph that starts with fourth, for some reason. And we are in chapter 5, and wow. We are living in a time where we're being expected to swallow their lies. I'm grateful that I'm reading this book, and I'm glad that John Goffman wrote it. So, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Ciao.